all told ourselves how productive this pandemic and its associated lockdowns would let us be. While most of us have honestly only really upped our biscuit eating game, Mr Joseph A McCulloch has actualised the sort of productivity we all dreamt of in early 2020. Not content with releasing expansions for his fantasy regimental Battler Oathmark and his fantasy skirmish game Frostgrave, he's now gone and released a whole new sci-fi game for us to flip our way through, Stargrave. It's a mighty fine looking hardback book from Osprey Games and comes with 180 full colour pages, adorned with great art, tidy layout and loads of inspiring photos of minis doing battle. After starting out with a really vague, the last war tore apart the galaxy and left it right for roaming mercenaries type intro, which is just begging for you to make your own narrative stamp on top of, things get going with the basics of what you'll need to play. There are no shocks here, you need minis, dice, d20s in this case, a table, some terrain, a crew sheet and templates. And with that out of the way, we get onto the good stuff. Chapter one is all about assembling a crew. But let's pause for just a moment and answer the question that's been on everyone's lips from the start. Nope, Stargrave is not just Frostgrave with lasers and spaceships. We can't stress this enough and felt it needed to be said from the outset. That's partly because the two games do tread common ground in various ways, even down to the futuristic doppelganger type cover art. Stargrave certainly uses a very similar book and chapter structure to Frostgrave's 2nd edition, and it shares some of the fundamentals from the game, but rest assured, there are more than enough tweaks, changes and additions to make this a different challenge and have us itching to get gaming. Okay, on with the flip through. The leaders of your crew switch from Wizard and Apprentice in Frostgrave to Captain and First Mate here. But this isn't just flavourful name changing, it will totally alter your crew's formation from the top down and your captain is chosen from one of eight backgrounds, while your first mate can be chosen from a totally different one of these same eight backgrounds. This instantly makes for wide tactical and narrative possibilities. The options here are flavorful and diverse, with each choice boosting certain stats, some of which you'll need to decide between options on, as well as giving you a list of core powers to select from. These backgrounds include genetically modified biomorphs, Han Solo type rogues, more technologically attuned robotic experts and techers, and Mal Reynolds type veterans. Captains choose five core powers, three to four of which must be from their own list, while first mates function in a similar way, with their own stat modifications and a reduced number of core power choices. After picking your captain and first mate, it's time to bulk out the rest of your crew, who are split into standard soldiers and specialist soldiers, with up to four specialists allowed and a maximum crew size of 10. You can make any of these crew into robots when you pick them, and this will change the way they interact with some of the rules and core abilities. This crew then gets armed with a range of equipment, listed at the end of the chapter, and it's obvious that Stargrave is a game ideally suited to playing out a wide range of sci-fi backgrounds, be they your own or existing ones. Chapter 2 is where the rules proper kick in. There's table setup, loot placement, then a turn sequence that runs through initiative determination, followed by different activation phases. The captain phase, where your captain and selected nearby soldiers activate, the first mate phase, which functions in the same way, and the soldier phase, where the remaining crew do their thing. Finally, the creature phase rounds things out. This is the NPCs who activate via a simple AI type procedure. Much of this, and the following activation and movement, will feel very familiar to Frostgrave players, but hey, if it ain't broke, don't go tweaking it. There's similarities in the combat section too, but we find the multiple combat examples given here are certainly clearer. After that, it's shooting, and here, as you might expect in a game with lots of guns, there's some points of interest. Crits, which were an optional rule in Frostgrave, are baked into Stargrave, meaning that on a roll of 20, you win combat or auto hit with a shooting attack, and you'll do extra damage. Not covered in this part of the rules, but we'll mention them now anyway, there are interesting extras like grenades and flamethrowers too. Powers are at the core of your captain and first mate's abilities, and there are some simple rules attached to using them that we suspect will have a pretty big gameplay impact. In Frostgrave, wizards can choose to empower their spells, essentially trading health for power, and in Stargrave there's a system called Exertion, which works in much the same way. But there's an additional system, any power with a strain value that's greater than zero 
will do damage equal to strain to the person using it, and that's regardless of exertion. What this means is that there's an ongoing cost to using some of the potentially more game impactful powers, especially if combined with exertion, and that cost is to your most vital commodity, the ability to stay alive. Now, perhaps to counter this new negative sort of damage dealing, there's a power move that's been added. What a power move means is that a player may make a 3 inch move before or after using a core power. Now we really like this, as it allows your characters to pop off a power before ducking into cover, or to make up that last bit of ground to open up a line of sight angle. And you're always allowed to do this move too, even if your power fails. Rounding out the gameplay rules a loot collection, and we'll have a bit more on loot later, and a basic AI table for how the uncontrolled creatures, which in many cases will actually be humanoids, act. Now this is really simple, and there's one slightly befuddling consequence of that simplicity. Missile weapon creatures will fire at a target if it's in line of sight and range, but otherwise, they'll not move towards a possible target. Instead, they'll just move randomly. That means they're not really decisive in actually coming in and attacking with their guns. It's not a huge thing, but it's perhaps our one very minor quibble that leaps off the page of the new book. And that's it for rules. The last 100 plus pages of the book consist of the wider gameplay possibilities and focus on narrative campaigns first, which lets Joe get into territory he's well known for. The in-between battle consequences, such as the concerns of injury and death, followed by the more positive stuff that will happen to your crew. First up on the woohoo list is crew experience. Your crew has the potential to earn a maximum of 300 points per game through achieving various goals. And by spending this experience, you can level up your captain or first mate. Each 100 points represents a level increase and every level change brings an improvement. What sort of improvements? Well, there's a table to check and there are tons of tables in the book. With Joe behind the columns, the contents are usually fun to reference as well. But in this case, it's quite a basic one. It tells you if your new level unlocked a new power, unlocked a stat, or made it easier to perform one of your powers by lowering its activation number. You'll also get loot from the battle, and it's split into two types, physical and data. Data functions as a means to money, experience through information, and tech and secret unlocks. Physical loot is, well, it's physical items. That in itself is a change from Frostgrave's singular treasure table, but this split also factors into the game. Physical loot must be unlocked before it's collected and then has to be physically lugged around the battlefield, encumbering the one who grabbed it, and potentially it can change hands over the course of the game. Data is unlocked too, and this can be done with the aid of different skills, but once that unlock happens, it won't incur penalties on your model. This makes for gameplay where certain specialists may head for one kind of loot, while others need backup to get the physical supplies out of battle. There's a black market feel to buying loot post-game. Less items are readily available than in Frostgrave, and they're determined randomly from a big table of options. It adds to the feel of a crew doing their best to scrape through in the vastness of space, and we really like it. There are pages upon pages of items you'll want to get your hands on, ranging from grapple guns to gravity suppressors, jet boots to plasma blasters, robot repair kits to swift suits. And those are just the advanced tech. There are also alien artifacts, and here's where you get all the goodies you dreamed of as a kid, such as the Blessed Horath and the Garkon Tick. Well, we'll work out what they are once we get gaming. You can spend loot on more crew or upgrades to your ship as well. The ship is the vessel you travel around in and live in, and works kind of like your base in Frostgrave. Chapter 4 gets into powers in detail. This is essentially a huge listing of the many different options you can give to your captain and first mate to make them unique. It's a broad amount of stuff, there's some really cool combinations you can make, and there's lots of flavour. Chapter 5 contains 10 scenarios, each one with its own gameplay or narrative twist, including one with moving cover. It's based in a starport, and ships potentially jet off, removing the protection you were hiding behind and possibly scorching you in the process. Chapter 6 is a bestiary, covering the many creatures you'll encounter in your games. These are determined on two different tables. Random Encounters brings more alien creatures into play, bioworms, primitives, tanglers, 
warp hounds, sewer dragons and more, while the unwanted attention table is the more humanoid opponents you might meet. Ruffians, bounty hunters, pirates, shock troopers and so on. Getting to page 161 and it's the credits, which give us a chance to give our compliments to the layout team, the artists, the mini painters and the terrain makers who have helped to make this book look as great as it does. Finally, there are crew sheets and power cards to copy, templates to use, and a quick reference guide. All in all, this is an exciting book, and we're looking forward to getting into some Stargrave gaming soon. With various plastic sets of figures on the way from Northstar to support the release, it looks like 2021 is going to be a good year for sci-fi fans. This video has been brought to you by WI Prime, Wargames Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.